Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, CERN uh, 6 Hangout. Uh, at the, welcome to the Hangout with CERN. Sorry about that. Today, we're going to talk about uh, very hot stuff and the early universe. For that, it means that we will be talking about Big Bang, about uh, quark gluon plasma, and the hottest and coolest stuff you've uh, ever heard about. So with me today, I have a great team of people. So I have uh, Urs uh, Weidman here to my uh, right, who is a theorist working on this topic, as well as uh, Stefan here also, another uh, theorist. And they will be there to give us all the real deep uh, understanding behind all those questions. We also have a group of uh, experimentalists directly from the ALICE control room. ALICE is one of the four large experiments running on the Large Hadron uh, Collider Accelerator at CERN. And uh, in the ALICE control room, we have uh, four people there with us today. So we have uh, Despina, as well as uh, David and uh, Antonin. And also the shift leader, because they're in the control room and we're taking data at the time as we are uh, speaking. And Leticia is the current uh, uh, shift leader. So I think Leticia will come for uh, a short moment. We also have uh, Fraser Kane with us. Hello, Fraser. Fraser is a journalist and uh, uh, interested in astronomy questions. Ken Vid is another experimentalist, also from the ALICE uh, experiment. He will be monitoring your uh, questions today. So if you have any questions, you can post them in the question window or use Twitter to send us a message at uh, hash ask CERN. So it's A-S-K, small letters, CERN in capital C-E-R-N. So hash ask CERN. And we will, Ken will be monitoring your questions and pick among the most interesting ones. And we will uh, try our very best to answer them. So. Let's get going. I, th I think we will have a great time here. We should have fun on Simonac. And uh, let's uh, start with uh, Despina. Despina from the ALICE control room. Can you explain to us what is the goal of the ALICE experiment? Because it's a very uh, dedicated, very special experiment. So tell us more about uh, ALICE. Hello, everybody. Hello, Pauline. So here we are in the ALICE control room. Uh, for those who don't know, the name of uh, the experiment stands for a large ion collider experiment. This is the one of the four LHC experiments which is designed to study collisions of uh, heavy ions at very high energies. So the goal of these uh, collisions is to recreate the conditions of uh, the very early universe. What happens is that uh, when LHC accelerates uh, these very massive objects, which are the lead ions, to uh, velocities uh, very close to the speed of light, and they let them collide, uh, we, at the point of collision, we have very high density, uh, very high energy density, and also very high temperature. And these extreme conditions have a result that uh, the constituents of the lead ions, which are the protons and the neutrons, melt. Uh, so the, 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 the protons and the neutrons melt and the, the constituents, which are the quarks and the gluons, which normally do not exist free, become free for a very brief moment. And so a new state of matter is created, what we call quark-gluon plasma. Okay. Now I this, uh, yes, sorry. I will stop you there. Let's okay. backtrack a little bit. You're saying that uh, uh, we're colliding heavy ions uh, together. Can you explain what heavy ions are? Maybe people are not quite uh, exactly sure what it is. So we are taking lead ions. What yes. Are... Well, the, we take lead atoms. Lead is one of the heaviest elements. It has uh, 82 protons and uh, 208, a total of 208 protons and neutrons. So we take these uh, atoms with uh, a series of uh, procedures. We remove all the electrons. So we end up with uh, fully ionized, uh, with bare lead nuclei. And it's these uh, lead nuclei that we collide. And they are very heavy because compared to the proton, which is the other particle, which ac is accelerated by the LHC, it is 216 times uh, heavier. So it's really something very heavy. OK. So you take a big mass 
a, a, a big glob of uh, protons and neutrons, 208 of them, and you smash them against another blob of 208 protons and neutrons. And of that, the quarks that are inside the neutrons and the protons, they get free for a short moment. The, the quarks get all mixed up and tangled, and, and they produce this very special um, state of matter that you call the quark gluon plasma. What are the gluons exactly? Maybe, uh, Antonin, you would like to answer that? What is the gluons? What are the gluons, sorry? So you, you may know that in physics, the, we, we think about in terms of interactions. So in physics, there are four fundamental interactions. So there are the ones that, uh, that make your, let's say, your daily life, the one you are used to, which is electromagnetic force and the gravita gravity. And there are also the, the weak force and the strong force. And what's about the, the strong force, this is the, the force that binds together the strongly interacting matter, like the core of the nuclei. How the nuclei are able to sit, to, get, to sit together, all the nucleons are able to sit together. And below even the nucleons, what's inside the nucleons, so the quarks, how the quarks can glue together. And in particle physics, we, the way we think in terms of interaction is that the interactions are conveyed by some special particle. And the special particle that give the strong interaction, this is the so-called the gluons. Okay, so the gluons are keeping the quarks together within the protons and the neutrons. So yes. when you collide the big blob of 208 protons and neutrons against another 208 protons and neutrons, then out of that emerge the quarks and the gluons, and they form a state and a uh, kind of a fluid with all those particles floating around. Is that is that correct? That's maybe a theorist could uh, could confirm on that. Is that pretty much uh, the picture, Earth? Could you? Uh, yeah. So this is indeed the picture. The the idea is given that these objects are very massive, and they are collided at these high energies to uh, deposit the entire mass in a very small volume. And that automatically leads to a very high density. And that automatically uh, implies also a high temperature in the end. It implies thermalization processes in the end. And why do you want to create such a mess? <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Uh uh, Stefan. Well, it's, it's in, in a way a un unique possibility to study a, a state of matter which otherwise cannot be studied in the laboratory. And it is in contrast to other kinds of matter that you usually study, like in condensed matter in a crystal, for example, or in water, in other liquids. It is governed by a completely different force, by these gluons that were mentioned before. And so it's a very interesting thing to do this in laboratory and to try to find out as many things as possible about this state of matter. And is there any uh, quark gluon plasma outside of, in the middle of our uh, detectors here at CERN? Can, can we find some quark gluon plasma at, uh, in nature? How about that, Hers? Well, in, in the detector there is, uh, that's, uh, the, that's where it is produced, clearly the the high uh, temperatures or densities, they, they would cool down or explode if uh, expand and thereby cool down if one would just set, put them up uh, on a table. Um, on the other hand, in the thermal history of our universe, and that is the other big word we want to discuss today, the Big Bang, in the thermal history, we um, uh, expect that this high temperature and exactly this mass produced now, reproduced now by LHC, existed in the early stages of the universe. And uh, that is certainly another important motivation for looking at it, although the connection is possibly a bit more difficult to make. Okay. So if I get it right, you recreate a state of matter that is so hot and so uh, dense that was that only existed at the time of the Big Bang, that we don't find it elsewhere in the universe right now. Yes, so, okay. so we are not aware of, um, at threat to, to the best of our current knowledge, 
we are not aware of um, existing astrophysical objects that would reach this density and temperature at the present stage. Okay. And you are talking about the thermal history. Why, why do you talk in terms of thermal history? What's your take on that? Uh, yeah, so that is the, the current model of, of the Big Bang that actually it was, it is a, there's a term history, so it, you, you can say it about each moment what, what approximately what time after this initial singularity it was, but you can also think about the temperature, and the temperature has a history. It started from a very high temperature and then went down, and there were some, yeah, probably there, there might have been some phase transitions in this history, and so that's why we believe this is. So why is the temperature of uh, cooling off? Is it because uh, where, where does the energy go? Is just so because it's, it's the expansion? Right. So that is the expansion of the universe. It's actually the same in the heavy ion collisions. Also, these heavy ions after you have produced a little bang, it it uh, expands very quickly, and by that it, it cools, and then that's the same for the universe. So the, the, the universe we observe today was initially in a very small volume, and it expanded, and by that it, it also cooled down. Okay, so you distribute all the energy that was in a very, very small part of the universe at the beginning. It expands, so you well, spread it. Well, you have to say what, what we observe today as, as our today observable universe was in a very, very small volume. And then it expanded, and by that, it put down. The and uh, how do we know that the universe is expanding? So that, that was one of the, the big discoveries in the last century um, that you know, we looked at uh, objects, astrophysical objects in different galaxies and we could measure their properties, in particular the light that comes to us from these objects and we find that well, that the light is not quite the same, it has, doesn't have the same properties as, as the light that is emitted on Earth, let's say. And uh, you can measure from the properties of this light that comes to us that actually these objects travel away from us. Okay. And that, yeah. Using the Doppler effect, which is now only used to give us speed tickets on Earth. That's so, it. Uh, yeah. So it's a, yeah, it's a it's a very funny Doppler effect. On the one hand, of course, the um, because something disappears, um, we know it from a, a race track, from a from a car. <coughs> That, that there is a Doppler effect. But on the other hand, what, what really matters for the, uh, as the light property is that the room itself gonna... is stretched. So the room itself expands, and that changes the property of the light. So a, a light wavelength that sits in this room gets stretched out, and in this way gets cooled in a fashion that is different from the fashions by which we experience cooling okay. here. Hey, so, hey, hey, Pauline, doesn't that bring us to our question? Why not? Yeah, Ken, uh, you, uh, you had some uh, special questions sure. for us for our uh, sure. listeners today. Yeah, we're, we're mainly at, uh, looking for science questions on social media, but just to make it fun, let's play a quick game here. We will be looking for the first answers, and the prize is going to be uh, a download of one lead lead ion collision from Alice. Uh, okay, so we think this first question, probably we're going to get an answer pretty quickly, so we've got two questions, easy and hard. Who is first credited with evidence for the expansion of the universe? We'll take the first one that comes in on Twitter or Google+. Okay, we bet you're going to get that one. But now, can you get this one? What famous, and I love the sound in the background, Steve, thanks. What famous 19th century writer proposed a theory that the universe would stop expanding and then contract in a miserable and terrible conclusion. We'll take the first answer on that one, and that one's a bit bit harder. Back to you, Pauline. Okay, sorry, now that I hear Big Ben uh, in the background, I realize I forgot to introduce <laughs> Steve. Uh, Steve uh, is in uh, the London Science Museum, and uh, we are hearing uh, Big Ben chiming behind, so... It's, it's not quite Big Ben. Which, this is Alice Lighton, who's from the museum, Okay. And uh, what, what, what is that clock that we hear? That's the Wells Cathedral clock from the 13th century. Um, 13th century, something recent compared to the Big Bang, right? Okay. 
Okay. So Big but, Bang to talk about the Big Bang. Very good. <laughs> we also you should so we also have Tina Wickstrom here, Hi. who's usually in that room where you are, but yeah. she came over here with me. Hello to that room. We're we're over here at the Science Museum because actually uh, the Science Museum, you might not know this, Pauline, but but in the fall, in November yep, of next, November year, next year, there's gonna be a special exhibit. What is it on? It's about the LHC. Um, and we're going to have objects from the real machine in the exhibition. Um, yeah, it opens in November 2013. We'll even have a bit of Alice in the exhibition, so you should come see it. Wow, bits, yeah. bits and parts. They have well, one thing you should see that's behind us, because we'll have to change location to plug in soon, but one thing behind us you should notice. What, what, there, there's a the, the <clears throat> telescope replica, and I'm not going to say the name of that telescope, because it might give you know a hint to the answer. It's to okay, one of the, Steve. Like, we got an answer before I finished answer. talking. We have a... Steve, we have an answer from YouTube that was nearly instant. A uh, hat tip goes out to Chris Flange for writing Hubble and then countless others on YouTube before oh, I finish yeah. talking. We got that one, but guys, we're still waiting for is. that 19th century writer. Back to you, Steve. Oh, the 19th century writer. That's a great one. But Okay, so there it is. There is a one-tenth replica, right? Yep. Of, of, the, of the Hubble. And Alice, what's next to it? Actually, there's a, there's a wooden telescope there next to it. So that was the first telescope to take photographs um, for astronomers. So it was used to photograph a solar eclipse in Spain in 1860. Took photographs of the sun. Wow, so may maybe uh, maybe I, we can hand it over to, to Fraser to tell us how, how it is, you know, we're, we know that, that Alice is looking way back in time, but before we were doing particle physics we were also looking back in time, weren't we? And we were using other methods to go back there, like this. Well, all, all telescopes are really just time machines, right? So you can, uh, you know, as we look out in space, because light takes, is moving at the speed of light, the further out we look, the further back in time we're looking. So if we look to the moon, we're looking at about, say, a second away. If we look to the sun, we're looking eight minutes away. And if we look to, for example, some of these distant galaxies out to the edge of the observable universe, we're seeing 13.7 billion, uh, 13 billion light years away and therefore we're seeing light that came towards us <clears throat> 13 and a half billion years ago that was that that left those regions so telescopes are time machines excellent okay back to you Pauline <laughs> yes thanks uh, Steve and uh, and, Ken, and Ken and Fraser on all this now let's go back to the Alice control room so we, we were, were looking at uh, those, uh, creating this quark gluon plasma. And so you're making a huge mess. I'm, I'm a uh, scientist working on Atlas. We take one proton on another proton, and already it's messy. So you must be getting events with an incredible number of fragments of particles sticking out in all directions. So we have some, in fact, on the slides here to be uh, seen. So. You can see them scrolling through there. Can you tell me how can you study that? For example, uh, uh, David, can you can you tell me how can you manage to learn and how can you follow thousands and thousands of tracks? Uh, do you try to re reconstruct everything there? What do you do with a well, mess like this? What do you do? Yes, we do try to reconstruct as much as we can, and in fact, this is why we created Alice to be able to cope with. Uh, this large number of generated tracks that we have in this in this collision system. Now, what we do in these collisions is that we, we classify them according to how much, how many tracks, how many particles are coming out of these collisions. And then, it, because these these two uh, lead nuclei are very large, what you can have is that they can either hit themselves head on, or that they can just hit them like passing by on a peripheral uh, collision. So. You can really have like two balls hitting each other head on or not. And what we use is that we, we use the, the we estimate that the number of, of particles coming out of the collision depends then on how the collision was geometrically also. So if you have a head on collision, you have a lot of energy involved in this collision and you have a lot of particles coming out. And if you have less particles coming out, you can relate this to a collision in which the two nuclei just passed each other and didn't hit each other head on, but they just hit each other like peripherally, as we say. And this is one of the, the things that we use to classify these collisions and then study further their, their, uh, their properties to see if we can find any hint that we have indeed 
uh, some behavior that is consistent with this quark muon plasma. But if you end up with thousands of particles sticking out, what can you learn from that? Are you trying to learn something from each of them, or is there some collective behavior? Does it act like thousands of free people, like a huge crowd with thousands of people running in all directions? Or are they well behaved like schools, kids getting into the, the school in an orderly fashion or something? Well, that's the thing. You want to really study if they have any any collective behavior in this sense, because if they're coming from some thermalized system, if they're coming from this liquid state, they may have relations to each other, and this is something that we really study in, in many different ways, actually. So we are indeed looking for some behavior that is a bit that is a bit that relates the particle production somehow, so that they have some some collective behavior, as you say, and. Um, one of the, the first things that you can think about is if you're colliding if you're colliding protons and you're colliding lead, you can think of lead as being a lot of protons colliding. That's one of the, the, the things that you can think of. But then the question is, is indeed a lead collision just a superposition of proton collisions? And this is something that we study, and we find in fact that it's not so. There are, se there are several different things that are that are not as if the lead collision was a superposition of proton collisions. And, and this is indeed this is uh, how we try and figure out more about what it is that we have in this earlier system, in this quark muon plasma, before we then have this explosion and then we have all the particles that we detect. Because we have to somehow infer some properties and some be behavior of this quark muon plasma. And this, just, this really behaves like a fluid with a collective behavior, collective properties for the whole thing, not just random motion of all these things, but they have some sort of a collective behavior. Yes. We, ah, we very interesting. Okay. Yes. I see that Ken uh, has been gathering some questions. So maybe uh, I see one here uh, that is relayed by one of my colleagues. The question comes from a listener who is asking, why was the universe in a super compact, infinite density and high temperature state in the first place? Why couldn't it have been in any other state? That is actually a very good question, and uh, so far about this very, very initial state, we don't have any idea. So our, our theory doesn't give us an answer to that question. We know what happens after the state was there, after it, the expansion began, so to say, but we cannot say where this initial state came from. Why don't you Google it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. The scientists our history starts at the point of the Big Bang. What, what, yeah. what came before, actually, we have no idea. Actually, it's even worse. We don't even know the theory that would be needed to describe this very well. Because we know that gravity is very, very important for this, of course, and also that quantum effects become important if you go to very, very early times in the history of the universe. And, and at that point, we would like to have a theory that combines quantum mechanics and gravity, so the theory of Einstein theory of general relativity, but this theory is not yet completely understood, or one can say that it has to be developed in a way. Okay. So is it possible, Ursa, that uh, before the Big Bang, that the Big Bang was the follow-up of a big crunch, that maybe we're in a cycle of uh, big expansion and big uh, contraction phases? As, as uh, Stefan pointed out already, in, in going back in time in, uh, in uh, our uh, history of the universe, we come into a regime where our theories that we have developed and tested uh, stop working. They stop working because um, the theory of Einstein, general relativity, would have been to, uh, supplemented by concepts that we don't know how to embed in this theory. Um, in the uh, um, theory of Einstein, in fact, uh, if, if you go back in time, the notion of time ends with a big bang. So there are various uh, discussions of how to continue this or not to continue. But I think it's fair to say that there is no crisp statement. And um, the question whether there is something before the big bang used in our um, human understanding of what was yesterday is not a question that is necessarily well posed if it comes to the Big Bang. Okay. 
You but but don't we find ourselves, sorry, in, in a universe that has dark energy that is actually the expansion of the universe is accelerating? And and so, you know, the the observations that people make now is that that the universe is just going to accelerate its expansion apart and so there you know will never be a big a big crunch. And so if it was some kind of cycle, yeah. we're out of that cycle now with the with so, the with So that energy. is right. Uh, one of the big developments over the last decade is that this question of whether the universe would in its current expand, uh, in its current state, finally recollapse, or whether it would uh, expand forever, um, has been addressed by precision measurement. We know now the matter content of the universe to an extent that uh, that we uh, and and uh, the the other content of the universe. So <laughs> not only dark matter but also dark energy that we uh, that we have an understanding that the universe will not recollapse. Yeah, okay, right. well, that's good news. Okay. And in fact, one of the it's not clear that it's good news. It uh, the the long term history is a rather boring history of a, a cooled down system, but uh, it's really long term. Long term meaning uh, longer away than um, the current lifespan of the universe. So uh, Ken, maybe you have uh, some. Uh... Sure, uh, absolutely. We're getting a couple questions right there. I probably should have just jumped in. So they're related, and, and it's tying together our, our whole theme here today. Uh, Kamal Pangani uh, asks on Twitter, so how long is this quark gluon plasma present in Alice? But before you jump in there, Alice, with your answer, we're getting a similar question. What is this era or epoch in the early universe after the Big Bang where the quark gluon plasma was? So if you guys can connect that with Pauline and at the Alice control room, when is, when, where is, when, how long is this quark gluon plasma present in Alice? How long is it present in the early universe? Back to you, Alice Control Room. Maybe uh, Despina, you want to address this? Antonin. <laughs> no. Antonin. Antonin? Okay. Okay. So I take this one. So let me let me maybe first start with the the universe. As far as I can tell you, so the coagulum plasma is suspected to be alive in the early universe for about let's say one microsecond. So between zero and up to one microsecond. So this is the life, or let's say the coagulum plasma in the hot and dense early Earth universe. Now, as far as Alice is concerned, the situation is a bit different. So the, the time span of the coagulum plasma is very important to keep in mind because it's just um, a very small amount of time. It's about 10 to the power of minus 24, 23 seconds. I mean, this is a very transient object in our detector. And actually, it doesn't live at all in our detector because it's, as soon as it's here, it's actually gone. And what we see is just um, the remnants of such a collision. Okay, sorry, Anthony, I, I missed the number. So you said it's 10 to the minus 24 seconds? 23. 23, Anthony. So it means a 23 zero after the, the digit. So, so the, the word, the word 0 0.23 zeros seconds. Yes. Okay. It's called a, a couple of yocto seconds. <laughs> yep, so it's okay. still yeah. even smaller than, much, much smaller than fact, I, I, I would like to make a, 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 a broader remark because it sounds as if uh, this is a negligible time scale, of course. And on a human time scale, it is. As physicists, um, we ask. Uh, we ask if we look at a pro uh, problem, not what is an absolute value. We put it into a ratio. For instance, the lifespan of a of a Human is certainly long, but it is negligible compared to the lifespan of human mankind. The lifespan of the Earth is certainly long, it is sizable, but still small compared to the lifespan of the universe. The, the scale of a centimeter is certainly large for an ant, but it's unimportant for many um, effects in the universe if we want to understand galaxies. The, the scale of a centimeter is, is uh, negligible. Now, what is important is that the theory of the strong forces, so the theory that governs the quarks and the gluons in um, this matter, is much smaller than the lifespan of this quark-gluon plasma. 
And it is in this sense that we can still speak about meta properties. So we look at processes that resolve um, units of one or a tenth in terms of this time span, while the system lives of lives of an order of ten. So in some sense, you can say we have a, a scale that is arguably very small on a. Um, on, a, on any scale we, we imagine in physics, and that's why we need the biggest microscope on Earth to study it, and the biggest microscope is this particle accelerator, LHC, that resolves the smallest distances, but the system we create is much longer lived than the distances we resolve with the most powerful processes, and that's why we can speak about meta properties. Just to get this clear. Okay. Good. Any other uh, interesting uh, questions, uh, Ken, that you'd like to yes. ask? Me? Absolutely. It's a hard one from Kishtish Gupta on YouTube. Okay, it's kind of topology. So, where is this universe expanding into? We've constantly been talking about the universe expanding. Help, help us work it through. What's it expanding into? Back to you. How about you, Stefan? Well, I mean, this is again a question that cannot be somehow even posed in this way, because the universe, and, and in general relativity, it is space itself that is dynamical. So in a way, we speak about the expansion of the universe, but you cannot say that the universe expands in some space, but rather it is space itself that develops in time. And, and so that's, yeah. in this sense, it's a subtle, subtle thing. And yeah. Are yeah. you saying that there is no space unless there is matter and energy and all that in it? Oh uh, no, that's that's again a, a, a very well, difficult and physical question. But we know, in, in any case, that the two are related. So, in, in in some sense, in the in Einstein's equation, which govern also the expansion of the universe, there is matter and energy on one side of the equation, and there is the properties of gravitation on the other side of the uh, of the equation, and the two of them are related. And at the actually, it is like that that energy and, and matter determine how much space is curved. So that's yeah. But I, I love this question. We we get this one all the time too. Yeah, it's, and in, it's in fact it, a very nice analogy if you if you scale down by one dimension. Imagine that we as humans would not be able to think in three dimensions but only in two dimensions. So we would only be able to move to the right and left but we would have not the slightest idea that we can move in a third dimension. The, the, the notion wouldn't exist for us humans. And imagine that we as two-dimensional objects are clued to the surface of a balloon, and that someone starts pumping up that balloon. So what we would observe is that since the balloon gets bigger and bigger, but we can't see the balloon that is getting bigger, we would simply see that all points on the balloon increase in distance. And we would see that this space gets bigger. And it is, um, uh, in some sense, this type of two-dimensional expanding space, while the third dimension that I have alluded to, uh, in which this balloon is embedded, has no physical meaning, that is a poor analog of um, what uh, Stefan has described. And the pumping up would be governed by an interaction between the space and the meta content of the universe. Wow. Or can I just say, that over here in London, we're scared. Okay? <laughs> this is scary. So this balloon, it, is it going to pop? I mean, this... Uh -oh. this, this <laughs> yeah, and, and that would be really scary. And, I, and, I, I, and it seems to me that the solution to the question that has not been answered yeah, is that right, Ken? I think the solution that, that hasn't been answered our question. No, no, we haven't got an answer on the one. We've got an infinite number of answers to the, to the one question, but concerning the 19th century writer, we're getting many, many 19th century writers who predicted bad things, but mm -hmm. not one who predicted an expansion and then a morbid contraction. That's morbid. So, so something pretty scary and pretty morbid. This guy was, I guess. Okay, and he was Good a poet. Clues. Good clues. A okay. I think, Fraser, you had something you wanted to say? 
Oh, I was just going to say that that a lot of people get hung up with this concept of the Big Bang as they they see it as an explosion that's in some other place, and that it's this explosion, and they're imagining that this explosion is happening within some other contained area. But but as you said, um, the Big Bang is an expansion of space. And so the analogy that we always use on, on astronomy cast, because the you know the two-dimensional balloon one is tough, is we imagine you know baking raisin bread. And so you know you can imagine that you've got a nice raisin bread and it's you know it starts out as just a, a batter, but if you're inside the raisin bread and you're standing on one of those raisins, you are one of those raisins, and the and the raisin bed is bread is baking then the, the bread is going to rise and all of the raisins are going to be carried apart from each other within this raisin bread. And so as any raisin, you're going to see all the other raisins moving away from you, but it's still kind of a, you know, you, you and in this case, the analogy does fall apart because the, you know, the raisin bread is in a pan and it's in an oven and so on. And so imagine that instead it's just the raisin bread is all there is. <laughs> then then that's, the, then that's the analogy that you can use. And so it, the question... I mean, you know, people hate it when we answer this question because essentially the question doesn't make sense because so, the universe is everything. So the so reason it's not expanding bread, into anything. The reason bread is everything. So outside the reason bread, the world does not exist. Yeah, oh, so there so, is no, there's no nothing to expand into. Pa Pauline, maybe you can correct my French. I know you speak French very well. Uh, that must be what the French call the the raison d'être. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, I'll sign off. <laughs> okay. Any uh, more pertinent um, questions to our members? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've got a couple people. We've got the English bassist and Enzo Russian, both on YouTube asking a similar question. So uh, Fraser and the and, and you, Urs and Stefan, we've got this we've got this raisin bread. It's expanding, but I got a problem there. Isn't it so nearly infinitely dense? Why doesn't it just collapse under its own sheer weight? If it was going to collapse, why didn't it collapse right then at the get-go? Back to you. Because it's not a souffle, I guess. <laughs> okay, who wants to take this one? Stefan? Right, so that there are different material properties that somehow govern the dynamics of the universe. And it is true that gravity is, in a way, um, more, yeah, um, attracting things together, but then there are other terms in the equation that actually lead to an expansion. And uh, so, in particular, for if if you imagine that there is not only the normal matter that you observe, but that there are other terms like, for example, scalar fields, which are something we, we use as physicists very often in, in at various places. For example, also to explain the Higgs boson, but if this kind of, of um, scalar fields have lead to very different properties, and they can lead to even an accelerated expansion of the universe when you put them into Einstein's equation for gravity. So let, let, let me make a, a, a let, let me follow up on on what Stefan said. We we commented earlier on already on on the point that ten years ago we didn't know yet whether the universe would collapse. Uh, collapse finally or whether it would continue to expand. It's like someone throws a stone to the sky and in principle this stone could uh, escape the um, orbit of the Earth and fly to the Moon and on what's out of the solar system. And depending on how well we know the velocity and how well we know the attractive forces and the initial conditions of that process, uh, problem, we can indeed say whether this stone comes down or flies away. So, in some sense, it's then a, a question of uh, precisely understanding the current dynamics and knowing the um, the uh, lo physics laws that govern these dynamics to determine the outcome. Um, and um, uh, this uh, uh, precision had been achieved over the last uh, decade to, so that we can now sit here and say the universe will expand forever. But your question about why didn't it collapse in the first place is just essentially the same physics problem but put into the past. Now in the past again I have this 
meta content, I have different elements, I have uh, an initial velocity, I, I have different elements and I can ask the question. And it happens so that these systems, for reasons that we don't know yet, because we don't know, for instance, what governs what Stefan referred to as scalar fields, what governs their importance in these equations. But uh, we know that the equations, as we have constrained them from data, imply an inter eternal expansion. Except, of course, if we miss some physics ingredient that we may discover tomorrow. But uh, that's the state of our current knowledge, and it has become very robust over the last decade. Okay, I think uh, we have lost the uh, Alice uh, control room, unfortunately, so we will have to wrap up uh, without them. So I would summarize uh, saying that here at CERN, we are uh, just about to embark into a new uh, period of uh, heavy ion collisions with a twist. So this time, instead of putting a heavy ion colliding against heavy ions, one beam will have heavy ions, the other beams will have just protons. So it will be a massive object coming under a small one. The idea will be to study what comes from protons being trapped inside uh, the ion and what comes from just having the protons alone. So they will try to disentangle a bit what's happening there. So this will start early in January for a full month, and then we should have all sorts of uh, interesting uh, answers to how this quark gluon plasma, if it, if it forms in those conditions or not, and what happens uh, to it. So we also learn a bit more about uh, uh, the early universe, the Big Bang, how it evolved, that we are uh, safe from uh, heading towards a new uh, Big Crunch. So that's uh, interesting. And I also see that uh, Ken received a positive answer from uh, Alicia uh, Stickney. So maybe Ken? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm seeing that uh, X Max Charming on Twitter got the answer at 11.36. Did somebody get an answer before 11.36? And the answer was? Okay, so the answer that I got at 11.36 on Twitter, forgive me if we got the uh, wrong one, was that famous 19th century particle physicist Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote a Poe's poem called Eureka, which really does get into transcendental cosmography and predict a big expansion and a very miserable contraction. Back to you. Of course. It has to be miserable. <laughs> very good. Thanks. I see that uh, the Alice uh, team is back with us. So maybe just before we wrap it up, uh, since we're going to go into this proton uh, heavy ion collisions in January, what do, you ex what do you hope the most to get out of this? Uh, well, what I can tell you is the, the, the interest, the main interest in proton lead collisions is that when you collide two lead nuclei, you create matter that is interacting and everything is very high energy density and you have everything very hot. But if you have a proton colliding with a lead nucleus, nucleus then you can probe something which is more like the interaction with cold matter. So you can see a reference interaction that is very interesting to compare to the lead collision in which you have this hot matter. But then what you have is a proton punching through somehow the lead nucleus, and then you see the, the, what's coming out of this interacting with the cold matter of the, of the lead nucleus, and that serves as a very nice reference for us to compare a lot of properties that we measure in lead lead to what we see in proton lead. Very good. So I think... Uh we should probably uh, wrap it up. Anybody wants to say a final word, something that is burning to, uh, to be said here? I, I, have, I have a question uh, from here. Since I'm surrounded by beautiful astronomy instruments uh, here, uh, I'm, I'm eager to know where, uh, and, and a beautiful clock, and there's a clock. I did not plan that. I did not plan that. It just happened. It's quarter to the hour. So, so uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, Fraser, uh, where I can uh, where I can listen and learn more from Fraser about astronomy. Uh, you have a place where you like to talk. <laughs> sure, that was. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I, I do a, a weekly podcast with a PhD astronomer named Dr. Pamela Gay called Astronomy Cast, and every week we pick a different topic 
including some of the ones we've talked about today. And uh, yeah, and we just uh, we just explore that concept top to bottom. I'm the person who asks all the questions, and Pamela is the big brain that answers the ball. So so we've we just finished. I'm trying to think. We're well into the 200s. So 280. So we've every single topic that you could possibly imagine in space and astronomy, we have covered it. So that's astronomycast.com. Thank okay, you. Astro astronomycast.com. What what yep. day do you do that? When do you do that? We do those on Mondays. We actually do them here on Google Plus as well as a live Google Plus Hangout. And so we'll we record okay. our show, our podcast, and then we also stick around for another half hour and and answer anyone's questions. So if you know, I can see tons and tons of hundreds of burning astronomy questions, so we're happy to answer, to take all those on as well. So if you want to come and join us on Mondays at noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, uh, what's that? 1800? <laughs> yeah. Midnight uh, in, in England, your time. Uh, in Tahiti? No, never In Tahiti, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so we do that uh, on Mondays. And uh, yeah, and we're, okay. we're happy to answer any astronomy questions. Excellent. And to uh, close this one, let's have an ad here from uh, Kate uh, Carroll, who is uh, next to me, and would tell us what is the topic next week. So, hello everyone. We're going to be joining the Google Science Fair next week. They're running all through December, they're doing December. So STEM being science, technology, engineering, and maths. And CERN is going to be part of this STEMBA uh, next Thursday uh, on our regular time slot. So we'll be posting more about that in the coming days, but stay tuned for that. OK, thank you. OK, thank you all uh, for uh, joining us here in the Hangout with CERN. So thank you for the Alice team. Uh, it was uh, David, uh, Antonin, and the spinner. Thank you to uh, Fred for uh, Joining us, the, uh, Fred, what am I saying? <laughs> Fr uh, Fraser. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's getting late. Fraser, and thanks to Ken for monitoring all the questions. S Steve for Merci, the... Merci, Pauline. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. And Steve for uh, uh, playing uh, wonderful chimes every 15 minutes. <laughs> it's hard work. It's me? hard work. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Be sure to come back. Come visit this place. Yeah, it's it's outstanding at the Science Museum here. I'm and right next door is the Natural History Museum we went to as well, which has incredible things in it. I saw an exhibit with Charles Darwin uh, things. Uh, old stuff, okay? Human living stuff, but old stuff. The Science Museum has it. amazing stuff as well. So. Yes. Oh, yes. This is really <laughs> a nice place. I absolutely recommend you to come here. Very good. Thank you all, and uh, see some of you next week. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.